So we won't be able to casually fielding questions on sustainable project management. Yeah, that, that, that. Oh, that's a joy. It's, it's okay. It's an interesting topic, but uh, um, uh, wait, uh, I'm already on camera. So I mean, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, I, I think there, there was like a little bit difference in the feedback amount. And that, that has uh, that, that's always an issue, but uh, yeah. uh, I mean, as far as what, what I uh, looked at, uh, it was consistent in, in the feedback that was given uh, on, on the market. But there were a few students that had like a um, lot of comments in the text, and some had just said like one of the bubbles, oh, yeah, that was it. But to be fair, uh, um, you get on a slippery slope with that very quickly. Yeah. It was partly it was right through, it was partly the uh, uh, sustainability, yeah. I think so too. There was not the buy in from Okay, uh, today we, we come kind of to the uh, first session to set a little bit the remit and uh, uh, look at different aspects. And we, we start with the private sector alliances. And if you have done the further reading from last week, we kind of cover pretty much um, in a little bit more detail the first paper that looked at why you would do a uh, um, uh, a collaborative uh, venture in the first place. Yeah. Um, you, you have to be a, a little bit with me because uh, um, I've basically <coughs> lost my Prezi that I just edited and I have a feeling it's still on in my office, which means it's not on, on the Prezi server, which is a bad idea. So, um, but we have the PDF, so it's not a problem. Uh, uh, plan B is there. So uh, we uh, um, cover today really why collaborate in the first question, uh, uh, point uh, um, and then uh, a quick history of uh, partnering key issues, some examples, and uh, I, I hope we can take that as a spin-off. In this seminar today, we have our first case scenario where we want to get our head around what, what can happen in a collaborative effort, what we have to watch out for, and uh, um, it's actually all about implementation. Doing the contracts, working together is fine. Yeah, but making it work on the operational level and the project level, that is where it gets really tricky and interesting. Yeah, and we, we have a look at the implications uh, um, with, a, 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 I think it's a Korean and uh, American uh, 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 joint venture that went actually pretty terribly wrong and uh, uh, has, has its value, of course, for learning. Now, partnership. Uh, um, uh, do, do you recognize the young man that is on my face? Yeah, hello, please join here. Uh, um, wh who is that? Uh, it's actually written. Uh, I tried to hide it with my virtual hand, but it didn't really work. Wh who is that? Uh, uh, yeah, Bill Gates. Yeah, so uh, he, he is a strong advocate of partnerships. So a partnership is an arrangement in which parties agree to cooperate to advance their mutual interest. And cooperate has a historical notion, which uh, Bill Gates may know or may not know. I prefer actually cooperate. Yeah, uh, um, uh, sorry, collaborate to cooperate. Yeah, there, there are many reasons behind it, and especially in the UK, it's loaded with particular arrangements. Yeah, so um, um, th there's a, a, a semantic and uh, legal reason actually behind that. Why, why I'm insisting on it, but not, nonetheless, uh, th this is uh, kind of coming from their web page. Our success has really been based on partnerships from the very beginning. And uh, um, does anybody know what he's referring to? Microsoft. Yeah? And, and what, what, well, Microsoft and? Yes, Microsoft was right. Yeah, so uh, that, that was one of the partnerships that they had at the very beginning. With? Was it Intel? Yeah, Intel, yes. I can see, you have probably read the paper. This is super. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And, and that was as well with IBM. Yeah? I don't know. Okay, oh. yeah, background knowledge. Very, very good. Uh, um, so th this, this was a start. Yeah? And uh, who partners? Well, um, we, we have the whole range, really. If you look at it from a, a supply chain point, you, you can look at the whole chain actually as a potential partnership and, and seeing themselves as a competitive network. Now that is probably the uh, um, highest extremes. But uh, um, who partners? Well, it can be suppliers, uh, um, uh, uh, customers, employees, potential competitors as well um, throughout. Uh, um, did you have any examples in mind from your industry maybe or where you want to work? Do, do you partner? Or 
rather not. We partner the college. Okay, partner with the college. Yeah, but we essentially are our subcontractor, mm -hmm. but we don't treat them as subcontractors, we treat them as partners. Okay. Because so we're only as good as their delivery. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, it allows you to build a relationship where you can as well say like, okay, this time we run it this way, but in the future we would like to see more of a different sort of delivery, just for you. We were very close to uh, partnering, setting them up at a training academy. Okay. So the partnership wasn't just sort of, you know, because I think partnerships is a widely abused word. You talk to somebody all of a sudden, yeah, that you're their partner, you know, so. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, we work very closely together. Okay, they're very interesting. And, and it's going all right? Yeah, the academy's just been binned, but that wasn't anybody's fault. They couldn't align the funding, so that was fine. The partnership's okay. still there. Okay, so partnership has, has survived, even the shortage of uh, uh, um, shared uh, uh, income potential, yeah, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, we have exclusivity agreements and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, to, to think of a few other industries, uh, um, um, what, what industry is that? Education? It's, it's, it's education, it's engineering training. Yeah. Okay, engineering training, yeah. very specific, uh, uh, very good. Um, do, you, do you have other partnerships in mind, maybe? Didn't Google do one with a laptop? Google? Yeah, yeah. Samsung. Samsung, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, there were a few uh, that came out with that. Yeah? Uh, uh, there was as well uh, Google Mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, um, yeah, a very good example. Yeah, so as well. Endeavor to, to uh, well, why do you work together with them actually? This is a good question. I wanted to post you something, but uh, why do, why, why do you see the benefit in working together with them? Why do you not do it yourself? Well, because we, uh, we want to influence um, their delivery mm -hmm. to meet our employer needs more closely. So to do that, it's, it's no good having an, an adversarial arm's length relationship. You need to influence their training mm -hmm. because we're only as good as what they are, and they are a supplier. Yeah. So whatever their output is, is our output. So, you know, there's, there's every reason to collaborate and be partners. Yeah. So it's as well as said that they deliver that you uh, don't have the capacity or, or the willingness to create capacity. Well, we used to have a own training centre, but they, that, they divested in that a while ago. Yeah. So we rely on colleges. Okay. So there, there must be as well probably a monetary interest, competence based interest. Well, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, um, probably with, with one particular college. You know, it's uh, the, the contracts for four hundred thousand pounds, so yeah. we'll, we'll play quite a big part in their delivery for engineering. Yeah, you, you're probably as well a prime supplier. Yes, uh, for, for them, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So um, the often when we go in those partnerships, yeah, with a hope to to really uh, uh, create more value, yeah, and uh, um, compensate as well for something where we may not feel confident or don't have the experience, the competencies, or in the Google example. Uh, um, maybe not the uh, uh, manufacturing capacity and so forth. Yeah, so we, we, we have a closer look actually at the drivers of that. Uh, um, we, we, oh, sorry, it's again bad habit. Uh, um, we, we have um, an increasing use of alliances. Uh, um, this is uh, um, between 1996 to 1999. Uh, um, in the last uh, um, kind of nine years, you, you can see probably that, that we had this well a little bit more aggressive games uh, um, that, that went into merger and acquisitions, especially the, the bigger companies were quite tempted by that. So, but uh, just to give you a few numbers, between 1996 and 1999, quite some time ago, uh, uh, those with two billion or more revenues developed an average of uh, um, 138 alliances. So there's certainly as well uh, an in investment potential in doing something like that, yeah, creating securities or avoiding mitigating risk really. Uh, um, alone in 2000 uh, um, you had like 10,000 uh, um, alliances formed so there, there must be a good reason behind it but we, we look behind that uh, um, in a little bit more uh, detail. So I, I hope this works. I, I want a uh, link uh, 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 to, to actually talk us through this. Let's see if this works. Hmm. Okay, so that, that is where I have to go sadly back to my prizzy because the link is disabled. This is not good. Ah, okay, shall I just jump in? I, I will have to deliver you the video too. So you have it already on the ELP, but it's basically in a VMAO format where I can't really uh, corrupt it either. 
So this is to come, uh, maybe as a homework. He does it a lot better than me. So he basically uh, um, goes into the detail where the different uh, uh, forms of partnerships sit. And uh, um, he starts here off at uh, looking at collaboration uh, on the pure basis on, on maybe uh, um, locality. Yeah, Who is this guy? Is he a He's a actually uh, um, uh, a researcher in this area. And uh, I think he belongs to a big consultancy that is specialized on, on helping you to, to find a, a um, way forward with different partnerships terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he basically starts off by introducing that as well your supply chain network, so if you contract things out, you kind of start to collaborate on a unique basis. So the incentives to actually work on a relationship or improve actually um, how you're working together is not set very high. You kind of buy the deal that you are getting. And often that is agreed in the uh, uh, contract. So that, that is uh, uh, the, the minimal form of collaboration. So you need very little trust. You normally write the details into the contract. And uh, um, you monitor it as well according to your contract. And you may have a project manager enforcing as well the interface that the collaborative effort uh, comes to the success, yeah, to the uh, uh, criteria you're after. Now a joint venture is a step further. Here you engage into a partnership where you both, you as a company, uh, uh, see certain benefits in uh, maybe not doing the <coughs> other part of the, uh, um, <coughs> well, of the venture that you have in front of you yourself because there's a lack of competence, maybe you, you uh, um, you don't have a lot of experience and you would require time to build the capacity, you know, the, the organizational capacity to actually do it yourself. So the Samsung a example with Google was a very good one. Yeah, so uh, uh, Samsung has experience in the mobile world, whereas Google has uh, uh, wonderful interfaces yeah, and uh, uh, makes uh, internet uh, or, or the whole uh, um, interface of the computer a pure joy. Well, it's overstated, yeah? but uh, um, there you would certainly see the interface that uh, Samsung came in with the experience of um, the hardware yeah? and, and producing and manufacturing it as well, whilst Google had the software expertise yeah? and uh, both, of course, adding reputation. So I think both the Google phone and as well the laptop had Google and Samsung on it, isn't it? Actually, I'm not sure about that. Am I? I haven't seen the laptop, I've only seen the mobile. Uh, has anybody seen the, the laptop? Okay. Uh, um, well, we, we have to research that. But uh, uh, in, in terms of joint venture, it's often a combination uh, um, of trying to learn from each other as well as skills, yeah, sharing resources to make it a profitable uh, um, venture, and at the same time to mitigate risks. And uh, they come in a wide variety. But we have a closer look in a second at, at that form. Then a strategic partnership is a step further. So uh, a, a partnership is really kind of an open commitment. So if, if you follow the literature recommendations, and uh, a, a few uh, um, uh, partnerships have done so, it's a loose agreement where you just, uh, um, well, you basically match out your resources. So it's not as romantic as I may describe it here. Uh, um, in the strategic partnership, you make a commitment to do business together. And uh, often you still have a scope of what you're doing, especially if you have a large business. You normally don't promise uh, um, uh, uh, that you do any kind of business together, but it's a shared effort. Whilst a uh, um, strategic alliance is a little bit more contractually uh, um, confined, where you set as well a mission out what you're trying to achieve together. Yeah, so uh, alliances are normally um, more on the uh, um, contractual side, and you, you uh, are after a mission, yeah, aims and objectives. OK, that, that was a quick run through. He gives you as well a few examples and uh, uh, talks a little bit about uh, trust versus risk. That, that is the main indicator, especially when you come from an investment side. But I, I've broken it, of course, as well down into a little bit more manageable chunks. and. Uh, Oh, yeah, OK, there's a little bit of repetition, but uh, um, repeating something is not necessarily a bad thing. So um, it's really uh, joint ventures. Um, if you look at it, it's a business agreement in which the parties agree to develop for a finite time a new entity and new assets by contributing equity. Now, um, if you translate that, it's exactly what I just described. 
Yeah, so um, equity uh, could be a commitment in capacity, uh, um, could be manufacturing. Uh, uh, yeah, I use a lot the term capacity. I'm already in my literature. But uh, um, so it, it could be um, your factory that you are actually using, whereas the other one breaks in their factory with the software design. Yeah, uh, um, so it's basically sharing resources versus uh, um, uh, um, yeah, as well commitment to maybe learn from each other. Yeah, so uh, often a joint venture is as well based on the uh, uh, premises that you actually have a skills in chain, exchange and a knowledge a exchange. But at the same time, that is what gets very uh, um, thin eyes. Uh, so some companies that are knowledge companies or have patents, they often don't like that too much. Uh, especially in engineering or, or technology-driven companies, it gets a very uh, um, soft uh, uh, line, especially if you work on those projects. It's quite easy that a naive question actually unravels for the uh, engineer of the other company pretty much your, your business secrets or, or competitive advantage. But uh, um, yeah, that, that is basically it. Um, here you often have as well a, a separate <coughs> community, so you need actually a, um, a management that is independent from the decision making of the both, uh, both companies. Um, this is more a legal requirement. In reality, it normally manifests that both the uh, uh, companies or joint venture can be multiple companies as well, have still a strong uh, uh, influence yeah, at, at board level at least. So with joint ventures, you have specific managers operating within the joint venture who are distinct or not being paid from either company? Yes, that, that is the idea. Um, in, in reality, they are all kind of hybrid. So yeah. I know as well uh, joint ventures where they work 60% uh, in the joint venture and 40% still in the other capacity. Actually, that, that is uh, quite common actually. Yeah, and uh, um, here the, the important uh, bit is a joint venture is literally a new company. Yeah, so it has as well its own liabilities, and uh, um, actually they exercise uh, um, control over the enterprise and shared revenue and spec uh, expenses and assets. And normally in a joint venture, you have as well a capacity evaluation. Uh, uh, so the equity and uh, um, yeah, so basically you basically uh, um, match what everybody's bringing in, and normally uh, um, expenses, assets, uh, revenues, and risks are contractually bound to the parties. Yeah? So you, you're basically accountable to bring that expertise from your company in, if you have assigned to that. Yeah? It, it gets actually, I, I have as well in session six, we, we do look at a few contracts just to get a feeling for it. It's actually quite detailed on this. Yeah? So there, there are often as well market share promises, mm. yeah? which, which can be quite powerful. Yeah. Um, there are other types of companies such as uh, um, joint, uh, joint Venture Limited uh, by guarantee. Uh, um, we, we have as well in uh, Europe, we, we have all kind of hybrids. Yeah? So this depends a little bit on your national system, what contractually or legally is possible. But it gets quite creative, to be, to be honest. Yeah? Uh, um, so Joint Venture Limited by guarantee with partners holding shares. But that is another option, so this is already going where often the management or, or the new company is uh, next to the estate of the old company. Yeah, so this is often where the manufacturing lines are, where you buy capacities, for example, from the joint venture from existing companies. Yeah. Then uh, um, the venture can be for one specific project only, when the uh, joint venture is referred to more correctly as a, a consortium, yeah, so this is normally an uh, uh, one of a tent. So here uh, the channel tunnel was a good example. Or continuing business relationship uh, is as well a possibility. So uh, if, if you actually look at a lot of joint ventures, some actually spun out a, a completely new company yeah, that still exists. So there are quite a few around actually. Uh, at the moment, uh, um, actually it was a takeover, but uh, um, if you look at uh, um, the uh, turbines, uh, um, uh, industry for power plants, uh, um, you, you just had the merger uh, between Siemens and Rolls-Royce and uh, um, in, in reality um, they are both matching their skills to be actually competitive with the international uh, um, companies that are in the same business. Uh, so here you have the likes of Toshiba, and well, basically as well very big uh, uh, conglomerates that have been very successful and, and we built uh, in the next years a lot of power plants, so this is strategic positioning. Yeah, and uh, they wanted to start as well with joint venture, but in the end, um, yeah, they, they bought it. Yeah, so I'm not sure that that is uh, a good example, but you, you get the idea of the consideration. 
Um, the consortium joint venture is uh, formed when one party seeks technological uh, expertise or technical service arrangement, uh, franchise or brand use agreements, uh, management contracts, rental agreements for one-time contracts, uh, um, and uh, well, in general as well, um, access. Yeah, so there, there are markets, there is expertise, there are maybe patents, so there's a lot more to it. And on the project level, you often have those interfaces uh, uh, that you have to use in your project, yeah, that are contractually binding for you. So this is often where it becomes quite meaningful. Uh, the, um, the joint venture is di um, dissolved when a goal is reached or, or profit margins are hit. Yeah, this is as well interesting. Um, sometimes you have weird scenarios where a project has to create a certain asset value and then the partners are bought out basically. And uh, um, there have been a few uh, where, where that is happening too. Uh, one of our case studies that we have in a public-private partnership is actually such a case. Yeah, so uh, quite, quite interesting. Oh, I have better examples here. So here are a few examples. Uh, um, does anybody recognize this? Or what, what is this? Well, the names are written. It's something with Land and Rover and then a Jaguar. Or what was that all about? That's Tata Steel, isn't it? They took over Tata. The owner of Tata. Yeah. And merged Jaguar and Land Rover. And then what, what happened? Why? Why did they do that? I'm not actually sure. But, <laughs> but I know that they're together now. They're the same yeah. company. Um, well, they're owned by the same company. But they've still got their separate... And yeah, entities. Yeah. So they're, they're basically uh, actually it, it was a joint venture between Jaguar and Land Rover, and it has been bought over. Why? Why do you think they came together? Different competencies, abilities, technological advantages. I, think, I would guess. Yeah, they, they were renowned really in the brand value to create very different value. <coughs> what was Jaguar f famous for? Or, or what, what is what, what do you associate Jaguar with? Oh, <laughs> this is just heartbreaking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the time. Yeah. Luxury. So, luxury cars. Yeah, luxury cars. And Rover? Land Rover? Four wheel drive, off road. Yeah. Country vehicles. Yeah. Same luxury cars. Land Rover. Yeah, it has become that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So Land Rover in the past was the old uh, military jeep where you felt every bump yeah? and uh, um, you, you would walk as well like this out of the car <laughs> because it had no power steering. Yeah? So uh, you, you really knew what you had done. But now you're spot on. Yeah? So they've shifted into the uh, luxury market, Land Rover, and you, you can see the lights. And, and uh, um, a brand joke was as well, there were some stars that designed some of the Land Rover special editions. Yeah, um, Again, I'm not really knowledgeable enough for that, but some, some popular star basically have their own design. Victoria Beckham. <laughs> yeah? yeah okay, 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 there we go. Yeah. The, uh, um, and, and she's a she pop star, right? She designed the evoke. Yeah. No, she, she well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she masqueraded as one for some time. Yeah, she put a name to the evoke. And then she's got a limited edition out that has like rose gold everywhere. Okay, now there you go. Yeah. So th this sounds uh, impressive. Yeah. So you, you can see that uh, sometimes uh, joint venture is done for a particular purpose. And it has probably a little bit outmatched the uh, traditional strand of Land Rover that we associate uh, um, Land Rover for. Yeah? But they still do those very reliable cars that you can drive around in the, in the wild, wherever the wild is. Yeah. Yeah. And you are Land Rover still one joint venture, they are still one company. This is a good question. Uh, um, I would have to look into this, but I think they're as well owned by a shareholder majority, and uh, they may belong now to another group. So uh, as, as far as it sounds to me like Land, Land Rover got the most out of the deal by entering into the luxury car market. I don't see how it's an advantage Jaguar. Uh, maybe it's more robust. You know, there was as well. Uh, um, yeah, yeah actually, this is a good point. Jaguar has uh, uh, kind of reinvented itself, though, like in yeah. comparison to what it used to be, like bringing out all the the F types and stuff and now it's just totally different. Well, okay. yeah. and, and I did it for uh, my marketing thing. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, very good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good marketing inside here. I'm very impressed. Yeah. So, and, and the, the, the uh, F line does work? Yeah, my friend's got one actually. And? <laughs> He's got an F type and it's, it's pretty cool. Pretty, okay, there you go. It's definitely yeah. not like what it used to be. An old man's car. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, okay, but uh, uh, so it, it has impact, yeah, uh, uh, certainly on the ground level. Um, another one, a uh, very old one, uh, is actually, are they still in a joint venture? I'm not sure about that, but Sony Ericsson, you may re remember them. I remember them from yeah. mobiles. I see lots of Oh, there, there we go, yeah, and? Like little slidey phones, yeah, I didn't actually realize that it was Sony Ericsson. Yeah. So what, what uh, um, where, where do those companies come from? Sony is? Japanese. Yes. And Ericsson? Swedish. Yes, Swedish. Spot on. Yeah. And uh, um, er Ericsson has this well kind of, they still exist, but they're, they're kind of other companies now. So there, there was this well something going on. But uh, the joint venture literally uh, was essential for the survival at the time. Yeah, and, and Sony uh, was as well struggling with the mobile side at least. Uh, so uh, um, again, it was mostly for sharing capacities and, and uh, um, promoting basically a product that is competitive at the new emerging market. Yeah. And uh, um, here I'm on, on very thin ice. I have to admit, uh, um, uh, what, what is here the joint venture? Does anybody know? Look at beer. <laughs> really bad beer. Really bad beer. Yeah. Cause of Isn't it? Cause of So, okay, it's two brands, yeah? Yeah. Okay, this, this is the first, uh, okay. So, and uh, um, they they basically tried, I think, to reinvent uh, um, beer drinking culture, and uh, it's this way mixes of beer, isn't it? Yeah, the adverts are shocking, where they're called Mandana. <laughs> With the mountains. Yeah. But you remember it, so yeah. 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 He's got his own like ice igloo disco yeah. thing, hasn't he? He's like, come and visit my place. So now you're right. Okay, so it did <laughs> resonate. It did resonate. Yeah. So uh, I clearly had made an impression, and uh, uh, Lila was really struggling actually for quite some time. So I think it was as well their survival parachute to to not go completely out of business. Uh, they, they are very big in America. But uh, yeah, um, they, they had uh, uh, issues in the European market and clearly promoted it well. Yeah? So uh, that, that is quite impressive, actually. Um, strategic alliances. Uh, um, yeah, it's a cooperative agreement uh, between two or more companies in which a common strategy is developed in a, a unison uh, and win win attitude. Uh, is adopted by all parties. So here really uh, um, the, the key idea is you, know, you <coughs> set out often uh, uh, on a set endeavor. Yeah, um, it can be as well uh, as short as a project, but normally um, it's, it's a long-term agreement where you try to build up capacity and position yourself in a market segment. Is that not exactly the same as a joint venture, the first two uh, points? No, basically you stay in your company entity and you basically uh, um, collaborate, uh, um, it, it's not a different company type, does that make sense? So you basically have a collaborative, uh, co cooperative agreement. So um, you both stay as a legal oh, entity right. separate, yeah, yeah. but you, you basically uh, cooperate yeah. and uh, um, legally you are both accountable for it. Uh, so this is often, uh, um, if, if you do something like that already, you, you would as well get respectively um, the risk for your share, yeah, and, and the other one mm -hmm. would carry the risk uh, uh, for their share. Um, the relationship is uh, re reciprocal, uh, I can't say the word, uh, with each partner prepared to share specific strengths with the other, thus leading power to the enterprise. Uh, um, so there's often as well this intent of learning from each other because they want to go into a particular market or, or Maybe, uh, um, so when I say market, this can be uh, um, product based, this can be as well uh, geographically based, uh, that you want to go into um, a new national market that you are interested in. Um, a pooling of resources, investment and risk, of course, uh, for mutual gain. So um, this is as well quite interesting. Normally, um, they monitor as well very closely in, in what uh, um, goes actually into this. So this is often as well a centralized uh, department uh, that looks after that. Actually, at this university, we have that too, as a, as a department for partnership and alliances, which is quite interesting. Um, uh, falls short of forming a legal partnership, uh, um, so you, you don't have a new entity. That's uh, so just an agreement that you collaborate. Yeah. Again, uh, uh, super examples. Oh, wait, I was too. 
Okay, now, now I need help. What, what was Starbucks? Uh, uh, what was Alliance here? Does anybody know? Did Starbucks have an Alliance? Actually, more. more well, where, where does Starbucks actually have? I think they have actually. Uh, um, uh, uh, there's probably an alliance. H have you noticed something here on campus? Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, what, what happened here on campus? Have you ever seen Starbucks? I think that they have bought the uh, um, uh, license from uh, what was formerly Costa. So uh, uh, Northumbria had always different coffees. You may not know this. But in 2005, that was, uh, um, yes, how would you describe that? There, there was no brand basically behind it. It was our own Northumbria coffee. And then there was a, a Costa that went into a strategic alliance with a cluster of universities. So you don't just find it here. You probably find it uh, uh, across England in a few universities. And it's a partnership, uh, um, or par it's an alliance basically, to, to build a uh, um, uh, coffee culture that suits the customer, which uh, we, we couldn't uh, develop before. Yeah, but uh, um, in, in that sense, uh, there were as well other alliances, actually. Uh, Starbucks went for alliance with the food supplies. Yeah, if, if you go into Starbucks, you will see their branded foods, and they're basically in an alliance. So they make the coffee and the drinks, and uh, the, the food is basically an uh, alliance agreement. And they use uh, Starbucks as a brand because it's popular. And you may have not noticed, but if you do read the fine print of the sandwich in the Starbucks shop, you will see it. it's different companies. Yeah. They've got a rainforest alliance as well. Oh, OK. So, so this go wait, uh, uh, ignore my example. So th this sounds better. So um, what? I don't know. I think it just said on the cup, rainforest alliance. Or something, so. OK, so there. But this is not an alliance. They have just <coughs> bought that. Oh. Does that mean that they're looking after trees? Is that what I think it's charity, yeah. yeah. This, this means probably their own land, somewhere in a rainforest. And okay, and look after it. Go, go and uh, put some water on. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Here gets guys, I don't know. And how far the details work, this is a different question. Yeah. Um, what, what was with Apple? Does anybody know there, the strategic alliance? Was there a strategic alliance? Who is hidden behind Apple? Microsoft for time, long time ago. Yes, it was uh, actually, this is a good point, yeah. So uh, Microsoft was actually as well behind it for, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. That is where well, all these wonderful Samsung? disputes came from. Samsung, yeah. Yeah, Samsung. Oh, oh, I'm not familiar with this. Here you are, yeah, <laughs> what, what was there? I was behind uh, Apple. Oh, they had a big um, lawsuit, didn't they, over the claims? It was something to do with touch screen and I think they'd work together yeah. and uh, that, that it was, was Samsung's th idea and they sued them. So you can see this large corporations have a lot of alliances, but um, <laughs> yeah, they, they probably uh, developed a screen together and that is true, they were fighting who had the patent rights. Yeah, and, uh, was like as well, yeah. That, that was, I think, for, for selling their music without the right licenses. Uh, um, I think that they're just, yeah. OK, there are a lot. Before I even <laughs> pretend that I know all of them, yeah, I, I don't. So I, I really had very concrete examples here in mind. Um, Nokia and Microsoft was another one. But uh, um, yeah, as well with Apple, you, you will see the interfaces. There's the Microsoft that you can use on an Apple, which I've kind of uh, rebranded. So there, there are a lot of strategic alliances. and. Uh, um, if you look at it in a, a um, comparison, uh, the main difference is really in a joint venture, the companies start and invest in a new company that's jointly owned by both of the par uh, parent companies yeah, and uh, has independent decision making or, or should act independently in the interest of the joint venture. Versus a strategic alliance is a legal agreement between two or more companies to share access to their technology, trademarks or other assets and uh, um, yeah, assets have it in it, so th there are a lot of interpretation. Uh, is there a question for this? Or, or confusion? Yeah, I just thought the previous slide had said that it wasn't a legal mm. partnership. 
Uh, it's a legal well, agreement, partnership. so you don't have a different. Uh, um, you don't have a different. So the the strategic partnership is the softest. You just say like, hey, I want to work together with you, and we are doing this, and we both sign this agreement that that we work together to enhance our business, and uh, that that is just an agreement. It has very uh, little legal valid validity. So basically, if you have disputes on that basis. You have to establish basically grounds backwards from where you started and everything that you did do at the time belongs to everybody. So you have to come to a settlement then who gets what. And if you are still in dispute, then they normally split it on asset value basis. Yeah. Um, one of the definitions for the joint venture was that it's for a finite time. Yeah, and this is not true necessarily. So um, normally, uh, this, is, this is something you can write into the contract. So joint ventures, for example, for mega projects, we do that a lot. And so Crossrail, for example, you will see that they, are, uh, um, they, they have a very long uh, uh, joint venture between different companies just for that one project. And then you will see that they probably won't actually sustain it afterwards. So it doesn't company. always have to be a finite time agreement. They can be uh, a lot of the joint ventures that, that I've worked with, um, they're, they're still together. So if you, if you look at any of the PepsiCo brands, you will still see that Walker's still in a joint venture with frito -Lay. Yeah, and, and that has been going on now for 40 years. Maybe there's oh, somewhere a, a contract that says 56 years joint venture, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, but uh, um, yes, so there, there's uh, um, the possibility. So joint ventures are as well often used for uh, um, uh, bigger projects as, as a kind of start and end date, uh, maybe with maintenance as well, yeah, the, the handover time that you have accountabilities in that time to, to basically have a closer tie to risk in, in the operations as well when it comes to the trial time. That, that is something that you could use joint ventures for. Yeah. And strategic alliance, again, is a, a more setting kind of this uh, um, legal agreement that you do commit your resources. And that, that can be very specific. Yeah? So the case that we have later on, you will see it's actually extreme specific. It's a, it's a particular market segments that they want to get in in a particular country in exchange for helping the other company building smaller cars. So yeah, you so said that previous slide does say a cooperative arrangement but a small contractual arrangement. Yeah, this is why I, I don't yeah. like the cooperative yeah. but uh, I should really take that out. Yeah, so you, you're, you're spot on. So it, it's, uh, um, so if, if you look at the joint venture, it's really a new company mm -hmm. where you pull the resources together. It's yeah. like, uh, yeah. In a joint venture, does it um, does it often mean that both companies can still remain independent whilst creating a separate entity? Th this is exactly the idea. Yeah. So um, uh, liabilities are, are basically just with the joint venture. Yeah. So as Sony, Sony Ericsson, there was still a separate Sony and a separate Ericsson. Yes, 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 absolutely. Right. So if anything goes wrong, you know, uh, um, then you can step away. Well, you don't step away. You still have the liability for what it's uh, um, actually founded on. And then as well the uh, resource agreements. Uh, so this can be as well asset value from the original groups uh, that, that would have a liability. But the companies can then sell buy that out. Uh, so if, if the joint venture goes against the wall, they can say like, okay, we, we buy our manufacturing capacity out for 100 million and uh, um, still let the sh uh, uh, ship then sink for a few billion worth of assets. Yeah. So the joint venture of Time Warner. Confuse me at the time because time, Time's a magazine, and unless it does yeah. a lot of other things, and then you've got Warner Brothers, yeah. and I, it just seemed a bit odd that they should come together. I don't know what they hope to gain from it or whether they gain anything from it. Time Warner, just why? Well, the uh, I suppose, in, in especially film industry, you have often people that have a lot of good stories and you know the the, the uh, a copyright on a lot of stuff. Yeah. And then the other ones that know how to make good films and that know how the special effects were. And uh, um, there, there are shareholder companies that have been founded that, that basically have increasing profits because exactly of that scenario. There, there was a joint venture between a company that uh, kind of the copyright to all the old history stories. And you will see them now in cinema very soon. Yeah, so that's exactly okay. the idea. Uh, um, yeah, that makes any sense if you want to have uh, a lot of old stories as well in movies. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, sorry, and here again, uh, it doesn't create a new strategy. But uh, don't uh, worry, we, we have actually um, all the case scenarios now to actually look into this. 
and uh, um, to get our head a little bit closer around it and look as well how this actually implies to us as project managers because it has very different implications. I, I, I hope you, you see the magnitude. Yeah? In, in one, your company is liable for everything in the project, so there, there may be uh, uh, more risk averse whilst in joint ventures. It's a very good engine to try new stuff. Uh, if you're experimental and you want to combine all the newest technologies into one project, you probably do it in a joint venture, to be honest. Yeah, the, uh, just for legal reasons. And then experiment around. Yeah. Um, strategic alliance, uh, the five criteria for a strategic alliance is uh, critical to the success of core business goal and objective. So you really set that out, yeah? what, what the relationship is about, what you're trying to uh, do. So for example, um, it could be a simple, so controversial example, yeah? uh, um, Mozambique at the time uh, um, wasn't a country that had beverage drinks, and I remember that. Uh, um, Pepsi and Coca-Cola, very unethically, no, it was unethical, but uh, they decided that only one company would try to go in the market, and that that would be their country market. Uh, in exchange, Tanzania was given. Yeah, so it, it's similar mm -hmm. markets, but uh, um, do you have sometimes agreements like that? And it was a strategic alliance for bottling and uh, all the supply stuff that you do with Coke. To get a Coke, you need uh, um, the liquid in the bottle, and the liquid itself is a chemical compound that you mix with water and, and certain uh, um, uh, carbonized water, actually, usually. And then you, you basically fume it up a little bit, and then you have the wonderful sparkling drink. And uh, they shared capacity for that yeah, to, to build the infrastructure. So, um, yeah, key was here the goal and objectives. So, to develop the markets, once it's developed, the alliance was over. You know, they could uh, both go into the same market because it was a market that would drink fizzy drinks. Yeah. So that, that's, uh, um, <coughs> that is probably like a very grand example, but uh, um, you, you get the idea. Uh, critical to the development or maintenance of core competency or source uh, of competitive advantage. This is often how it's framed, but uh, um, as I, in, in one of the papers, you may have read that already, the competencies is a very loose uh, 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 topic. Uh, or um, yeah, a term that is uh, interpreted depending on, on your particular scenario. So that is always something that needs like proper definition, uh, potentially as well legally. Uh, blocks of competitive threat uh, um, can be as well a motivation for this. It creates or maintains strategic <laughs> choices for the firm and uh, mitigates a significant risk to the business uh, again, you can uh, see that as any kind of form. You, you may not have like a manufacturing line that you need from the other place. Yeah, you, you could build it probably yourself, but it would take a lot of upfront investment. Yeah, so this risk would go away with something like that. Yeah. Now, when you look at the paradox of uh, uh, competition and cooperation, and I have as well these uh, um, uh, other video, there's uh, another video from last week that um, this is well additional uh, uh, reading. Uh, it's from, uh, I think it's a pharma company, is it BISF or something like that? The, uh, but basically, they, they basically have a card as well that uh, cooperation is the way forward. But if, if you look at it, uh, um, you, you have, uh, there, there's certainly a, a notion of, uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, slippage. So if, if you look at competition and cooperation, you will see as well in a cooperative uh, um, effort, you will still compete maybe on a, a basis of um, coming up with the best solutions. Yeah? How can you contribute to this? How can the other party contribute to this? And that, that is something you, you should keep as well within a project um, to, to actually get the best ideas, information, um, solutions promoted yeah, to the forefront. Uh, um, but what it does uh, mean is that you may not compete directly against each other on the platform of doing the same thing. Yeah? So if you look at it, competition, discrete organization, uh, clear, sharp boundaries, uh, negative sum game. So um, uh, you win, I lose. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now in a cooperation, uh, um, you, you have basically embedded organization. So there, there's one side of, of the unit that does their service, but they have to collaborate as well uh, uh, across their organizational uh, um, basis into the other uh, organizational basis. So hence you are one organization coming from 
two organizations. I hope that makes sense. Hence, embedded organization. Uh, with that comes fu fuzzy boundaries. So often you, you get a lot of insight as well how the other company is doing things. Now that, that can be desirable, can not be desirable, depending on where you stand. And uh, um, the idea really being, uh, from a game theory uh, perspective, is a positive sum game. So you both gain due to the cooperation. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, then, then you have as well the altering uh, um, uh, boundary and uh, network level strategy sits somewhere in between uh, where you work, uh, where you kind of commit to a long term relationship with your supply chain or your customers, but in reality you still do it on a contract to contract basis. Uh, so that then sits somewhere in between, and then you, you fight basically these uh, opposition uh, um, uh, or opposing forces if you want. Yeah? So what are the options for uh, developing resources? Alliances uh, ranging from formal to informal gaining access uh, due to uh, um, additional uh, resources. Um, actually, often with alliances, you have as well kind of a competence or capacity recognition where you as well evaluate, where you may have to bring a training in or build capacity together. Now, actually, this is often why you set up in alliances. Um, now, here we have as well the, the uh, forms that I already spoke about. Uh, mergers and acquisition is really uh, formal and buying in resources um, uh, um, from like mergers really buying the uh, um, resources to acquisitions where you basically buy the whole organization capacity. Yeah. Uh, um, so sometimes as well to, to kind of separate it and, and have a few more businesses. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Then uh, internal development is uh, um, again the uh, core competencies or, or prefer to think as well of organizational capacity. Uh, uh, and here you have uh, unilaterally or helped by another uh, um, building up of, of competencies. And uh, um, this is uh, as well often the source that is perceived as, as uh, a competitive advantage. Now we, we have different advantages and disadvantages. If you look at the internal development, so we start from the bottom upwards, the advantage is certainly you keep control, retain all benefits. Now, this is, of course, uh, uh, only if you train your own people and you build up the capacity. If you go with a training service, you, you just partner with somebody else in that case, yeah, or, or contract that out. So disadvantages uh, are normally referred to in the literature, are limited to all resources, and you take all the risk. So it can go as well wrong, you know? but that, that is on each business. So you, you want to make sure there's the right mix. Uh, um, merger and acquisition, again, uh, um, we, we, uh, to, to be fair, this is a summary. We will look actually a lot more refined at that in the future. Yeah? Uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions, ready-made products, uh, uh, markets, know-how is there. Yeah? So they know as well how to do it. They, they may already do it uh, uh, in another part for another uh, product or, or service. And uh, um, the, you have as well the organization already there. Yeah? So you don't have to kind of build up that working together, that everybody knows what their role is individually on the project level. Yeah? Um, so with the, the, the um, disadvantages, it's difficult to value. Yeah? So uh, it, it becomes, well, basically, uh, normally you go in with a dual diligence and you look what you have, what does the other one have, and then evaluate where is the decision making sitting, who has the power in that relationship. Uh, it's, a, it's a heroified uh, summary of what I what you could probably describe more accurately. And uh, um, then it's well difficult to integrate potentially. Yeah? So you, you will see actually that a lot of mergers and acquisitions, are the, the biggest problem is really to, to make them merge and then to, to make them work collaboratively together. And they often ex as well existing uh, um, culture. And uh, um, that, that can be hindering, especially if you try to cut costs, uh, set as an intent then merger and acquisition is a very delicate uh, uh, undertaking. Alliance? How does, how does mergers work with, with due diligence and shareholders? How does it's evaluation, how much you pay. Yeah. How does that tend to work? Um, you've got, you've got two companies agreeing to come together for a particular purpose for a reason. Yeah. Now you'll have shareholders of this company, yeah. you'll have shareholders of that company, and this company's asset value or whatever might be bigger than this company, mm -hmm. but you merge them together to create a whole. Yeah. So how does so you, you have normally uh, a compensation being paid, yeah, and and or, or uh, many shareholders pitch as well for the outlook of greater profits. 
So uh, the shareholders are normally uh, quite into mergers and acquisition because you, you create more Economies net value. Economies of scale advantages now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and, and more net value as well, potentially. You know, right. when you uh, consider something like that, you, you often do a capacity consideration. Uh -huh. yeah, so what is your organizational capacity? And then you look, oh, they're, they're a lot more effective. On what do you mean by capacity? Yeah, this can be pretty much everything. This can be uh -huh. how you, uh, uh, how quick and, and uh, effective you put screws in, into a, a car frame yeah, and, and connect the, it's actually not screws, but uh, anyway, the, uh, um, it can be as practical as that. Uh, up to like whole uh, product segments yeah, or, or uh, sub products that you're producing where they know that the quality is higher, where you uh, know that it's, they can do it a lot quicker, they have a lot less waste or they, they buy less resources and still kind of can produce the same quantity. Uh, so th those are, are ways of, of starting to measure it. But you're quite right, uh, uh, this is very specific from uh, uh, industry and product to industry and service and product and so forth. Uh, so you, you have to every time look at your ratios really on the uh, performance basis of your industry. Uh, that, that is where the uh, dual diligence becomes actually quite tricky. Uh -huh. yeah? uh, okay. But uh, if, if you look at it in a project level, I bet uh, we yeah. uh, uh, as a, a small uh, um, similar group could already do this. Yeah? Because uh, um, you will have already the expertise on the project level and you, you see the skills. So if, if, I, if we, we could do the exercise and probably build something up like that quite easily. Yeah. Does that partly yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and the integration is then of course trying to, to make it work again on the organizational level. Uh, alliances, pool resources, know-how, uh, spread risk and capital commitment. Yeah, so this is very important. Uh, this is often as well as a minimum defined. Often they hope for more. Yeah. Uh, that they often as well close it. If this happens, then you have to do that, and uh, you uh, uh, and I do that too, yeah, something like that. Uh, that is always quite interesting. And then uh, partners' goals may uh, conflict, organizational confusion, lose control of know-how and uh, technology. This is the biggest concern often with those uh, type of um, arrangements. And uh, um, actually, a lot of alliances have probably started with some kind of getting to know what the other one is doing there exactly. Yeah, so there, there is this one, the side to it. Oh, and I'm already running over time. Okay, we, we stop at that point. Any questions? Okay, more in the seminars and a full case study to come. Yeah, uh, um, maybe you want to familiarize yourself with the world of DU and General Motors. That, that is what we're looking at. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much, and I see you six. This time sharpish. I, I know now where the room is. I won't come here back. So that this is quite good. Okay, so just to uh, bring you back, uh, we, we started with Private Sector Alliance last week and we kind of had a discussion why this is actually beneficial, what we have. So we had a strategic alliance versus the joint venture, which is a own company setup, if you want. And uh, um, we kind of arrived, I think, at the uh, benefits of the strategic alliance. And that is really why I, where I want to dive back in. So you may remember that still there are certain uh, um, uh, uh, five criteria for strategic alliance, and we had as well the comparison. I don't know if you remember that. This was kind of the network level for uh, and the strategic level of the organization. On one, we had the competition, yeah, so we are competing maybe together uh, uh, for the time of our consumers. Yeah. So do you, do you want to play a wonderful video game or read a wonderful book or the suggested reading from Robert? Yeah, so this is a competition that I'm up against with my lectures. I, I know that very well. Yeah. But we, we can cooperate. Uh, uh, new media may make it uh, possible to, to find a, a wonderful way of doing so. You, you may remember that. And then we had that as well, I think, alliances, yeah, ranging from formal to informal, getting access and additional resources. So here we had the internal development, for example, keep control, retain all benefits. We, we had that already, right? Do you remember that roughly? Yeah, okay, so we, we have uh, uh, two students nodding. This is always a good sign, yeah? So I, I move on, and we read as well the types of motives for strategic alliances. 
So uh, we, we had the loose market relationships, so those are networks, opportunistic alliances. You may work together because you see a store is really like promoting retailers, yeah, typical one. Uh, uh, you, you see they really sell the products that you are into. So um, then you may jump onto that train. So um, here it can change very quickly with like markets shifting or, or product demands. Yeah? So if, if you have a particular retailer, you kind of buy into their scheme. Yeah, and, and you may fall out of the scheme or you may be able to, to kind of surf the wave of the scheme, if, if that makes sense. And then you, you had more formal, uh, um, so in between you, you had subcontracting, licenses and franchises that are kind of in between the loose relationships uh, um, to, to for formalized ownerships where you have consortia and, and joint ventures. And then you had as well formal integra integration and uh, uh, my colleague always said that this is the dark side. Yeah? So he said uh, uh, this. Uh, so I, I was always associated with this because uh, I, uh, if you look at my CV, I, I worked actually for some time in the merger and acquisition unit. Yeah? So it's uh, sad. But we, we did as well the joint ventures and the strategic alliances, so the soft touch. So we have as well a lot of agreements that we actually don't look at in partnerships. We have as well uh, um, agreements that you will collaborate. So there are very loose touch uh, uh, arrangements as well. But uh, anyway, here the formal integration is uh, um, you make it part of uh, one of your companies, one of your organizational forms. So you, you look at it as an asset and resource transfer or capacity transfer, depending on how you term that. Yeah, and that is then a permanent arrangement, so a transaction. What was that site saying that all alliances are strategic? Because you go from one and the continuum to the other. We, we have as well uh, project-based ones, but even then you have yeah. kind of a strategic intent. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, what, what would be the opposite? Uh, the opposite would be like you realize you cannot do the contract when you fall in somebody. That would be not strategically, that would be kind so of contract. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, so this is an, a need, need to act basis. Yeah. Yeah. But does it, in, in the literature, you will see that as well. Particular uh, um, construction uh, uh, and uh, um, actually, where, where else do we have that? So response services in general have that a lot. Uh, that, that you use them co uh, capacities that they may be otherwise bound, but you buy them out with incentive of payment or, or agreements. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but we, we had that already, and it was again to set the scenes. Uh, uh, then we have as well reasons for international alliances. And uh, uh, here we, we, we come really into um, yeah, the, the big topics that we discussed already. So overcoming uh, government pressure maybe. Yeah, so especially, did you have a good example maybe for that? Overcoming government pressure? Where, where do we go for strategic uh, alliances international? We do that actually a lot. A very quick one uh, here, DTA. region. Yeah, DTI. DTI. Is it DTI? Do they help out to overcome government pressures and things like that? Department of Trade and Industry. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you're spot on. Yeah. So they have the networks actually yeah. outwards, and uh, um, for example, Europe worldwide, they have as well agreements, and uh, they they would uh, um, arrange this. So they are kind of the uh, um, interface that companies can use to to network, but. Uh, um, more, more practical, I, I was uh, thinking here of uh, examples of where they have succeeded. And uh, um, so one was, for example, Nissan was really struggling in, in the European market. So they went for um, an alliance with uh, uh, Renault. Yeah? And uh, um, you may know this, yeah? so Nissan sits here in, in Washington. Yeah? So it makes this way a great photo, just standing next to the sign, I'm in Washington. Yeah, but uh, um, the, uh, it's like basically 34 kilometers south from here, so tw 20 miles, yeah, more, more or less. If you cycle, you take the direct route. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, um, they, they basically arranged to exchange uh, know-how and access to networks. Uh, uh, if, if you want, the French had really good tr contracts in, in uh, selling their cars in a lot of European countries where Nissan was uh, having great difficulties to get into. Yeah, and. Uh, that, that was as well a government pressure because Nissan threatened in uh, the UK of not producing as many cars anymore in Europe. It didn't make sense. They were actually better off uh, manufacturing in Africa and, and other, I jump here quite greatly. So they were better off actually, ironically, uh, manufacturing in South Africa and uh, um, uh, uh, shipping it. 
uh, to, to the markets that they had in Europe and supplying largely to the African market. Yeah, so, um, and, and that was like something that the UK was quite interested in. Hence, they supported the alliance. Now, uh, um, lower capital investment is as well a benefit often. So uh, resources are already there. You don't have to establish fees for, for getting into networks, fees and, and ways of networking. Yeah? Uh, uh, neutralized competition as well. So of course, there's as well um, uh, maybe a danger. Yeah? So we have as well uh, agencies that look out for it that you don't become a, a monopoly. But of course, for, from a company point, it's very good to dominate the market. Yeah, you can then as well kind of dictate your own terms of conditions and uh, maybe have a dialogue with the customer only. You don't have to watch out too much for the competitor. Yeah? So it creates a certain uh, um, playground. Market access, we had that already. Joint research and development. Uh, this is often a tangible point yeah, uh, um, that uh, a lot of companies go in for, but we, we had the example already where it can go wrong. And then synergies. Yeah? So we, we had uh, a few complementary things. Uh, um, like for example, Starbucks, uh, they're really focused on coffee, but uh, um, just having a coffee and a chat, you, you want probably something else, like a fruit juice or, or like a water. Uh, if you just drink coffee the whole day, people will be able to tell all I'm saying. Yeah, the, uh, um, you, you may want to switch them to decaffeinated or something like that. So there, there are as well synergies that you can carry and make your whole business actually more attractive. Now, Sim uh, uh, Priest uh, was uh, one of the ones that really kind of came up with a frame for analyzing uh, international uh, strategic alliances. And you will see this as well, um, the OB model, uh, um, which uh, was kind of designed around the 80s. It was when uh, uh, a lot of big companies started going international. Uh, so we, we had the opening up of uh, uh, China, Japan opened up as well at the time. So I should be careful. China opened up for selected contractors only. Yeah, so this was a, a very uh, a close hand arrangement. But uh, nonetheless, uh, that there was a time where, where these uh, series came from. And when you look uh, at the objectives, you find learning, yeah, acquiring uh, needed know-how, markets, technology, as well in general, how you do business there, uh, uh, what the arrangements are. So if, if you look into that, there, there are other uh, um, themes behind it. Yeah. Leaning was another one. Uh, replace value chain activities. So um, if you're working together, you can lean as well on their value chain in their country yeah, instead of importing. So you just bring the products that are easy, uh, um, that, that, that are kind of your, your competence capacity, and then you basically integrate it in the supply chain for them. So fi filling in missing firm infrastructure. Uh, then, so we actually, this is what I did a lot in South Africa. Yeah? We, would, we would build capacities that wouldn't be yet there in, in some countries. And basically, then we could do our product ranges too and rent basically capacity from other factories. Yeah, bottling and so forth is a really kind of, it's not difficult to make, but it costs a lot. So if you have already bottling uh, uh, factories there, then you can basically jump on the bandwagon and maybe update their manufacturing process, and uh, uh, then it's fit for purpose. Yeah. Uh, leveraging was another one, fully integrate firm operations with a partner. This is then already a, a lot closer. Yeah. So uh, we, we have said actually a lot, uh, a particular big clusters, automotive, they do it too. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, in some industries, people get averse because you can quite easily see as well how they do things and maybe copy. So there's a there's a worry of the knowledge leakage, uh, that people steal what, what you have as an advantage. Uh, linking closer links with suppliers and uh, customers. So this is uh, kind of becoming aware of the supply uh, chain. Leaping, uh, pursue radically new area of endeavor. Uh, um, so especially if you have a product, and it's cool, but there, there's no market yet for it. You may want to try it. Yeah? And, and uh, in a strategic alliance, you, you have some brand power, and at the same time, the risk is kind of balanced. Locking out reduced competitive, uh, uh, competitive pressure from non-partners, that, that is uh, um, uh, uh, another one. And uh, this was extended, the, the model. Oh, yeah, sorry. There are positive aspects and negative ones. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I kind of explored them already in the example uh, um, that I gave. But uh, there were some uh, new ones, and, and they were kind of uh, expan uh, expanded by uh, David and Meyer uh, more recently. 
they said uh, that you have to extend the list of L's. Yeah, so there were six. They said there, there are three more that have become like, incredibly important for strategic alliances. So, and uh, they, they went into lending. So similar to learning, but more specific, uh, um, you, you could as well bring a team over. So actually in construction, for example, or education, we see that a lot. Yeah, so as well me, I, I get uh, actually rented out from Northumbria to other universities where then go for two weeks and and then the students have me. Yeah, so it's, I, I don't see how that is a win-win situation, but uh, um, sometimes it's, no, I should make jokes on that account. But uh, uh, you, you have the uh, lending model yeah, uh, uh, related to technology, copyrights, uh, um, patents sometimes. Yeah, so you can, for example, buy into a patent that is important for your process. Uh, again, licensing and leasing is then another way of doing this. Yeah. Um, another interesting one is lumping, so uh, similar to leveraging, but uh, related more specifically to economics of scale. So um, if, if you have products, uh, um, you can basically lump in uh, with, with a cluster that, for example, uh, develops infrastructure to, to bring your uh, um, articles forward. We, we see that actually uh, quite radically done, especially in developing countries. Yeah, so they cluster up. And uh, you, you get normally the, the whole uh, um, team coming around. So there's as well IMF, World Bank that kind of provides the finance. And then clusters of companies that come in to basically kind of create a platform where they have kind of the package deal that they're, that they're aware of sells best. Yeah? Uh, activities need to be the same more, uh, more or less, uh, hence between insiders. So there, there's as well, um, lumping is as well associated with uh, price fixing. So that there have been many investigations in that too. But still, it's one of the forms that, that is quite common. And last but not least is lobbying uh, has as well uh, received a little bit uh, bad press. Not just a little bit, it's, it's pretty bad press about it. Um, specific to operation, uh, cooperation to achieve stronger position in relation to contextual actors, uh, related to political, industrial, regulatory actors, uh, pressure groups. Uh, you, you will see this often in a very soft form in form of standards. Yeah, so if you have some the industry standards emerging, has often to do uh, um, that uh, basically companies came together and they see a preference to actually uh, refine the product and uh, have a better stance as well as securing a little bit how they are doing things yeah, uh, by uh, standardizing and then bringing it into the market. So if you want to go in the market, you have to comply too to the standards or you have to show you can do better you can always do that, but that is expensive. You have to convince them the standard authority or, or the committee that evaluates it that this is actually better practice than the standard. Uh, um, lobbying sets as well agenda. So uh, um, another famous topic that, that I'm quite uh, uh, passionate about, for example, uh, skills development and competences. Um, the, so companies lobby as well for that. Uh, a new one is megatronics. Does everybody know what that is? Okay, so somebody not. Oh, you, you work as well in, in the uh, in this area. Uh, what, what does it stand for, megatronics? My, uh, my understanding is a mixture between mechanical engineering and electronics. Yeah, and how they coordinate themselves together. Spot on. Yeah, it, 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 it came really initially from aerospace. It just did it, but uh, the ones that really pushed for it was the automotive industry. Um, they they uh, wanted uh, um, kind of a skill set for uh, um, people where they can do both because that was always the interface. You had people that were really good in mechanical engineering and they could really work it, but the uh, disconnect was they were not so strong on the uh, electrical engineering. And nowadays you, you may notice it, oh, that yesterday we, we discussed with some new cars. Do, do you know how your car is run now? Is it still mechanical, hydraulics and everything? How, how is it done now? So some people shake their head. Uh, how, how is it done today? <coughs> Yeah, it's, it's electronics and little motors. Yeah, so we have actually swapped the. So the little motors are still the mechanical leftovers. Yeah, but they have become a lot smaller, and we work now in incredibly with electronics. Oh, this is why megatronics uh, came such a hit. Yeah, and, and that came again. Yeah, so uh, large companies basically clustering up and really pushing for it. Uh, that that is a recognized skill. Okay. Now this is uh, um, kind of the idea of a conceptual framework. Uh, here you kind of have uh, the different uh, um, uh, yeah, um, 
so those are the topics that I want to cover really with you. So uh, one being the competitive advantage view, which we cover now, and uh, um, as well later on in the public uh, um, partnership. And uh, then as well the uh, competence-based view. Yeah? So what, what do they actually bring to the table? Then we go a little bit into the resource-based view. This is kind of outdated because uh, um, resources have now become as well competence. So, but uh, this is still the old view that you find if you work in large companies. This is still something you will be quite heavily confronted with. And then uh, uh, very important re relational factors. And, and uh, wh where, where do you think uh, um, where, where do you think the biggest trouble sits? If, if you work in project, in a change project, or you're in a company and you operate in a strategic environment like that, where do you think it, where the biggest failure rate comes from? Why, why do strategic alliances go wrong? Or, or joint ventures? I think it's trust as well, isn't it? <coughs> yes, yeah, trust. <laughs> Different goals, yeah. No, normally, you have some contracts. Yeah? So we, we could play here the legal side and say, like, oh, the contracts were not clear enough. Yeah, and, and that, that is very easy to do. And then project management, uh, I know from myself, I was always quite happy to have my legal team with me. And uh, uh, I really liked it as well when it was broken down and we had like clear basis to agree. But uh, it comes actually down to the human side of it. Yeah? So most partnerships and alliances really break down because uh, um, two decision makers, maybe senior managers or, or worse directors maybe of the companies, don't get along, then you're on very thin ice. So uh, um, one very clear thing to realize is when you come to uh, collaboration and, and alliances in any forms, the cooperation it, like leans very strongly on the commitment, trust yeah, between people. And that is something that you, as a project manager, you can as well create and harvest an environment where, where it's uh, more positively influenced. That doesn't mean you, you have to agree to everything. Yeah? So uh, um, be, be aware of your position and what you are after. So uh, shared values are somewhere hidden behind that. Yeah? So if you have different intent, that is maybe difficult to maintain. But uh, there's a possibility as well of coming to a, um, agreement of how you can actually work together. Yeah? And uh, uh, opportunistic behavior is maybe another hidden one. Communication is very important. And uh, relationship uh, term costs, uh, that, that is another one. If you start calculating that, you, you are on an uh, uh, interesting journey. But uh, that, that is certainly something we will focus on quite a bit. Yeah, because uh, um, from the statistics, this is where it goes wrong. So here you see it actually. Uh, um, Poor strategy and uh, business planning. Well, we, we have that too. Yeah, so you, you had completely different ideas. Yeah, as, as pointed out uh, uh, up front, you you want to build like the fastest, wonderful car uh, on on planet Earth, and uh, your your team member wants to sell as many cars as possible. Yeah, so that there may be a diversion point uh, uh, just based on resource base. But you can see it's only 37 percent bad legal and financial terms and conditions. So you can as well with contracts, and, and believe me, if you have a strong legal team, they're very good in this. Like uh, put hooks in where you can pull certain resources out that are yours. So um, yeah, you, you, you want to maybe even have an agreement, what are your resources up front, and, and uh, what are the partner's resources. It's a little bit like, I, I don't want to make the analogy, but it's a little bit like marriage. You know, if you're coming in with a lot of stuff and you really like your stuff, and, and you really don't like the stuff of your partner, but you really love each other, then it's maybe still worthwhile to agree that this is the stuff I brought in the wedding and be, we, we bought it before, so everything we buy now is maybe ours. But uh, so yeah, so this is where we are in legal uh, um, territory that gets very touchy. Yeah? And, and similar uh, touchy it is actually for companies. So they, they may come with terms and conditions. This is quite usual. And then, uh, as I shouldn't really say that, but a lot of joint ventures and alliances and merger and acquisitions have as well the aftermath. They, they say as well, these side of assets we are building together belong to me. You get the other stuff. Yeah, and then the other party comes back with the same. And then they negotiate, basically, the, the legal team till they find uh, uh, that it works for both of them. Uh, and, but 11% only on that basis. Yeah, it's not a lot. 
But the biggest one is poor and uh, damaged relationships. This is the biggest one. Yeah? Basically, people f falling out with each other can be small things, yeah? seriously. Uh, so be keep, keep an eye out for that. This is where where you remit lies. If you um, understand how to actually uh, uh, communicate, how to build trust, yeah? trust can break quite easily. It, it's fragile. And to rebuild it is very, very tough. But there are ways of doing it, yeah? cultivating, again, uh, um, trust and, and finding ways of working with each other. Now that, is a, that is a very soft background for you, but it makes a big difference. Now, um, this can be broken down. We, we discussed a little bit. So it's poor choices of partner, lack of understanding of firms', firms uh, resources. So especially if you, uh, shall, shall I go with a dating analogy? I, I go here on very thin ice. But the dating analogy, basically, that you will find as well in a few papers is that when you first meet, you, you have your best dress on and your best suit. You look very shiny. You are happy, excited to meet each other. And then when you are together, you go to your partner's house or, or you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I, I was bought, buying into this. Yeah, so this is a nightmare, uh, uh, the, the worst case scenario. Yeah, and this can happen as well with firms. Yeah? Uh, initially, you present, of course, your shiny assets as you see the, the uh, um, optimal uh, um, synergies yeah, of uh, how, how do they do this particular uh, um, platform. This must be magic. They must be so scientifically advanced. And you know, um, yeah. so we had that as well with some companies, I remember. That. We, we saw they have just a robot manufacturing plant where everything is automated and digital, so you could just press a button and everything would happen. And then we, we saw the factory and it's like, oh, it's not very impressive at all. So, uh, and uh, of course, you can't say that because it's a dynamic, yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, um, too, the trust is given too much to little, so um, as well, if you're too skeptical and you're just waiting for the mistake, then you're basically monitoring for failure. And failure is uh, a healthy thing in a partnership. Yeah, to actually start a discussion point, but if that is an exit uh, point already, you have no chance. Yeah, basically, your preposition doesn't actually allow that uh, um, the alliance could ever work. Limited information is another one. Lack of collective strength. Uh, um, so you may realize that actually you have a lot of parallel stuff going on, but the stuff you thought actually uh, could contribute to each other is missing. Uh, that, that is uh, uh, quite terrifying then. Uh, Inter-partner conflicts, uh, preference, interest, and practices. So that there's, again, the opportunistic behavior is a particular bad one. And interdependencies uh, where A depends on B, but B does not depend on A. Uh, this is particular bad. Now, uh, um, simple rules uh, for making alliances work, uh, um, placing less emphasis on defining the right business arrangements. So this, uh, oh, by the way, when I if, if I would tell this my friend, uh, we are still friends, I, I worked with a, uh, uh, yeah, with a Swedish lady together, and uh, um, she is now back in Sweden, works still for, for um, actually the same group. But uh, um, if I would tell her this, she would like basically want to throw me out of the window. So um, the, the emphasis basically set on, on less uh, contractual hooks, because you are already kind of setting a lot of scenarios into place. And the other lawyers that are reading this, like, oh, oh, they don't think we, we can actually deliver the capacity. Uh, so it, it creates a bitter taste as well for the management team. So it does help to kind of set like ground rules and how you maybe solve as well uh, um, conflict. Uh, so what, what the steps are, that makes sense. But uh, uh, what you really want to set emphasis is on uh, is developing the right working relationships, getting the teams where they actually work together kind of connected. Now this is again controversial. Some people see it as too much knowledge leakage uh, pos potentially. But here again you can set a certain ground rules. Yeah, um, yeah, creating ends metrics. So this is when it's completely formalized. This is normally not help uh, helping. Uh, um, it, it's normally better if you're creating a means matrix. So you, you actually uh, um, uh, measure out how you can contribute and where you can meet. Yeah. This is uh, a lot more sensitive. So th this is input-oriented, this is output-oriented. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, uh, eliminating uh, differences, uh, embracing differences, and actually kind of going on the journey with each other. Yeah, so this is an authentic alliance and an authentic partnership. If you kind of say, like, OK, they do it differently, let's see. Well, how, how is it? Uh, and, and try it out. 
Yeah, so you, you get the idea. Uh, establishing formal alliance management systems and structures. Uh, um, although I, I do like systems and structures, but uh, uh, you, you really want to establish uh, uh, enabling be collaborative behavior, inclusive, and not sticking necessarily to the structure. And then managing the external relationship with partners versus managing your own internal stakeholders and making sure that you uh, uh, find as well a way of, of proactively moving forward. Now, this will entail conflict, there's no doubt about it. Uh, because uh, in collaboration, you, you always have like uh, uh, not a reduction of, uh, there's a reduction of power, but uh, uh, you, you basically uh, uh, make them work together so they cannot just do the decisions by themselves. Uh, there, there are dependencies that, that come forward. When you say internal stakeholders, I mean that's when two companies have formed a joint venture. Yeah. That's your internal environment. Oh, I see. Uh, um, so, uh, but when you said that, um, you, you focus that you create uh, with your internal stakeholders that are going into this alliance. Right. So this is your company. company. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. Parent company, you said basically that, that they are trimmed off, that they have right. to expectations. Is that, is that hierarchical of importance or anything like that? Um, no, this is basically just taken out of the paper. So those, those were major findings. This was often a reason for failure. This was often how it did work uh, or, or how people actually received that they were ready to, to work together. And uh, internally, you know, you have then always elbow fights, mm -hmm. accountancy, you know, like basically you, you uh, arrive at more or less one system, and it's normally never one system only. Normally, everybody's still calculating if they are on the safe side with it. Uh, there's that set going on as well. Yeah, so the, the trust doesn't always carry as far as you may wish. Uh, yeah. uh, um, so uh, with this, uh, um, you, you come as well as uh, uh, to, to a level of organizational capability that, that can be developed. So uh, um, here we have uh, partner selection, considering relationship and strategic fit. Um, organizational cap capability is really how you bring uh, um, your organization, your team together to produce. Yeah, so for example, if you have individual skills, it takes some time to figure out who can contribute uh, and what piece to the team effort, yeah, to the product. And, and that is exactly what organizational capaci uh, capability does. So it kind of links the people to machines, to factory, to basically work together in a unit to produce products or services. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, um, so partner selection, uh, yeah, and I should add organizational capacity. You can then look at performance, productivity, time versus production time. You can measure it basically. And uh, that, that is often what, what companies use as an indicator if they want to collaborate. Now, partner selection, considering a relationship and strategic fit, uh, uh, then alliance structure. Actually, wait a minute. How was I meant to do this? No, this is basically two independent lists. So, uh, building and maintaining internal structures and alignment, then the manner in which the alliance is managed, establishing ground rules, governance, again, very important. And, and this is often where uh, you as a project manager may actually sit as well integrating that. Uh, so making sure that you have one governance structure that is accountable. And uh, dedicated alliance managers, collaboration skills, cooperate, collaborative mindset, embedded organizations. So this is again uh, kind of what we had on the slide as well before. And then uh, um, yeah, auditing alliances. Uh, um, in, in brackets with evaluation. If you're just auditing, you often look if everything works to the set measurements, but uh, in every partnership you will see other factors emerge. So evaluation is often better because you get a better understanding what the relationship is. And you may want to drop a few of your criteria you set up front and uh, replace them with new ones. Uh, that, that really kind of create a proactive uh, um, alliance. It can be as well that one realizes that the alliance is going sideways and they are kind of pulling all the resources as well out of the parent company. Yeah, then you, you have to act as well accordingly. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it's as well important for managing change. Yeah. Now, uh, oh, here is my analogy. Yeah, alliances are like marriages. The partner have to understand each other's expectations, be sensitive to each other's changes of mood, yeah? not to be too surprised if their partnership ends in divorce. Uh, um, 
nowadays. Yeah, the, uh, um, I'm not sure that I would sign up to that, but that is basically the analogy used by the book. Yeah, uh, many companies have a sort of uh, uh, nuptial contract, an agreement as to what is to happen in their joint property uh, in the event of a subsequent divorce. Uh, you, you may have heard of this. Uh, uh, typical for uh, um, formal alliances or joint ventures. Uh, that is really where, where you have those arrangements. Yeah. And it creates certain uh, tensions as well. Actually, do, do you have any questions at that point? OK, quite, quite a rampage through. Uh, be, be with me. Now, now we have to swap ones. Uh, um, so let's stop Panopto once.